basically five such six equations. So the key to doing analytic is basically divide and conquer. Break the system into the subsections that you can then look at triangles and geometry and solve. And so if I think of a typical system, you guys have seen my terrible pictures at this point many times. Um, and let's actually just for the fun of it, I'm gonna put in a wrist here, I'm gonna put in another roll here. So that's actually a six off, right? That is more like a human arm. Usually the way that I then think of it is you can define your tip, which is probably the point right here. You can define a wrist, and you can kind of define the base point here, and then obviously that being my elbow. And I've talked to a bunch of teams. One of the things that happens is if you can get these axes to intersect at this point, and you can get the wrist axes to all intersect there. Do you guys agree that the way I drew it, all three of this roll, this roll, and that axis all intersect and I see at one point? That means I can collapse everything down to talking about the base point, the wrist point, and the tip. If I give you a tip position, and I give you a tip orientation, do you agree that you thereby know the wrist position? In, if everything works out well, right? If a mechanism is simple enough that all of this kind of converges to one wrist point, if you know this location, you know the orientation, that means you know the direction of this line, well, you just walk back that distance and you know the wrist point. So the way that these things then usually work is that instead of the sixth off, basically break it down into three off, which is the wrist position, plus a three off for orientation. Right? And so if you know the wrist position, you can solve the base joints to get you to that location. So that you can solve joints zero, one, and two. Right? And then if you have them, what you're left is to solve the wrist to get the orientation that you want. So then you solve J3, four, and if you've got it a five, or not, right? Probably most of us don't have a five. Does that make sense? If further, you have that configuration, which I keep calling cylindrical, by that I mean that the base is basically in the horizontal plane, or I guess the axis is vertical, so it moves that way, right? And then the other two, the axes are horizontal, so they just slide. Do you guys agree that that is then a plane that is rotating? If that is the case, if this is cylindrical, kind of right, then I can split this into J0 and J1 and J2 as kind of the rotation of the plane. And kind of this is in the plane. Does that make sense? So for us, it probably means that we're going to break this down, we're going to compute J0, then we'll compute J1 and 2, and then we'll probably compute J3 and 4 as kind of the orientation. So instead of trying to solve the whole system as once, you break it into those pieces. Which means, let me go through and try to do that. Um, so I'm going to do this a little bit, well, I'm going to do basically the first half as the example. So I'm going to assume that, sorry, I guess I don't really need to do this, but that the wrist is given, and I'm going to basically solve the problem of going from the wrist position right to G0, 1, and 2. So solve the first sub-problem. And the reason I want to do it is to just walk through kind of the way that it normally happens um, and then to think a little bit about singularities and stuff. So I am going to be a little bit mean. I don't know if it's mean or not. But I'm going to make a mistake in here, which isn't really a mistake. It's a subtle omission. And I'll be curious to see who spots it. Um, and so I'm hoping that by the end of it, we're like, oh, we should have done that, and we'll go back and we'll fix it, right? So I'm not going to try to write anything wrong on the board. Um, but 
this could be a little bit subtle. So rather than just writing it out, I want to kind of go through it and then realize why. So if you notice anything that looks like an omission, let me know, because that might be the case. So let me, if this is our system, right, I'm going to say this is Q0, kind of Q1, Q2. Do you guys agree that just for completeness sake, the Fkin looks like x, y, and z is, well, I guess I need to find an x, y, and z, right? Is going to be some r times cosine q0, r times sine q0, and h, where r in that plane is just L1 times cosine Q1 plus L2 cosine. I think I put these up last week. Let me just put it up so we have them. Did you guys buy that? Any questions, any thoughts, any confusion? Everyone believe that. Anyone notice that I didn't define my zero position? Which isn't actually the omission I mean yet, but do you guys agree that basically I define my zero position as that? Right? So that way the cosine gives me my horizontal if I define my angle L to there. which means in this picture, Q2 is negative, right? Q2 is basically measured relative to here, so that's a negative Q2. Agree? So I've already written it in a way that kind of clearly shows step one, this is J0, right? This is J1 and J2 to solve those pieces. So I'm breaking the three off into in the plane and rotation of the plane. Okay. So, Let's say I give you x, y, and z. What shall we do? So if you're given x, y, and z, well, would you start by figuring out r and h? Q0. So you guys agree that if I take the first two equations, if I take x equals r times Q0, and y equals r times sine q0, do you agree that q0 is a tangent 2 of y comma x? Does everyone know a tangent 2 versus a tangent, coding wise? Everyone happy with a tangent as a math function? Um, so tangent being sine over cosine of some angle, a tangent means you get the angle out of, call it x. Um, if you know the sine and the cosine separately, basically, instead of writing the a tangent of sine over cosine, or a times sine over a times cosine, which would be the same thing, you can write a tangent two, uh, sorry, of a sine a cosine. So you don't have to do the divide by. So I could have written this as a tangent y over x, right? Because I could have computed y over x, which would have eliminated r and given me the tangent. And then I could have written the a tangent. What's the problem with doing that? x equals 0, right? x equals 0 is totally well defined. It's just that I can't do the divide by. So the solution that most libraries implement for you is they define an a tangent two function, which is just y comma x. And that is perfectly well defined if I give it zero comma one, if I give it one comma zero, if whatever I give it, it is well defined. Hmm. So that you don't have to do the divide by. So in all of this, you will usually see an a tangent two. You will very, very rarely ever see an a tangent two. You guys good with that? So that means I've already solved.
step one, I've solved J0. Okay, so then H is just going to be Z. How do I get R? Are you okay with that? By the way, I'm going to come back and fix this. To be fixed. Yes, I also hate square roots. And if you don't see it now, let's come around and I, I think and I hope by the end of it it'll make sense. But, so now we're in the plane. So do you agree that we now have that we now have an R and an H, and we have a triangle that looks like an L1 and an L2 like this. And we're given those coordinates. Uh, how do you solve those triangles? You guys remember the cosine rules? Sine rules, cosine rules? Ugh, geometry, no! Um, you remember, right, you can draw that triangle, that angle gamma, and you can write this length, which I will call d. d squared is equal to l1 squared plus l2 squared minus 2 l1 l2 cosine of that angle. And I call that angle gamma. Full cosine rule. d, well, is r and h, right? So do you guys agree? that I can write cosine gamma is going to be L1 squared plus L2 squared minus R squared minus H squared over 2 L1 L2. You buy that? Right, because D squared, Pythagoras, R squared plus H squared, H and R. I.e., gamma is A cosine, I guess A cosine is just that, of Any red flag showing up yet? Nobody wants to yell something out. What if I give you a point that is about here? What if I give you a point that has a very large D? What's going to happen to this? Do you agree that cosine, kind of by construction, right? The cosine is going to go from 0 to 180 degrees, kind of from plus 1 to minus 1. There's nothing that says that this number has to be plus 1 to minus 1. If I give you a giant point that's way outside of the reach of the robot, well, this is going to be a huge number, which means this is going to be much less than minus 1. So what do I need to do? Does it make sense that, OK, I've got my robot here, and I'm trying to reach that point, And well, I can't get there. I can't get there. What are you going to do? Right? I mean, A, there is no solution. The best thing you can do is get as close as you can. How do we get as close as you can? Uh, you could rescale D to like L1 plus L2, something like that. Yes. You have to bring in basically, let's say right around here is like the longest you can reach, right? You have to effectively project it back down there. Which is the same thing as basically saying if this term, uh, if, I don't have to write this, let's say if the cosine gamma is greater than 1. No, I can't write it like that. Let's call it, someone give me a letter. 
What's a letter that's not X, not R, not A? Beta. Beta? Okay, we'll call it B. Sorry, because I want to be like, if this is equal to B, right? Basically, if B is greater than one, that means you're trying to be here. Then I would simply set gamma equals zero, which means you're collapsed. If B is less than minus one, I will set gamma equal to 180 degrees, right? Else, I would set gamma to be a cosine of B. Does that make sense? Does it make sense what's happening? Right? And basically, if you give it a point that is way far away, you can't reach it. So the best thing you can do is stretch yourself out, which means gamma is 180 degrees, which means this point is a very negative B, you're 180 degrees. If I give you, let's say, I'm going to cheat a little bit and make L1 really long and L2 pretty short. Wait, how would B be greater than 1 ever? In this case. If I give you a long L1, in a short L2, but I ask you to reach down here. Can you reach down there? You can't reach that point, right? Because the best thing you can do is you can swing to about there. So that is a case where R and H are almost zero, but this is a really large number. It, if this triangle exists, that holds, right? But basically, you can come up with, I mean, OK, let's put it this way. Set L2 to 1 micrometer. If L2 is 1 micrometer, it is a tiny, tiny, OK, make it a millimeter, right? It's a tiny, tiny joint. There's no way I'm going to reach that. If L2 is really small, well, then this term doesn't exist. What happens to this term? This becomes really, really, really small. When this becomes really, really small, even though the top number is fine, this whole thing becomes really, really big. Right? So this is the equivalent where either you're outside of the reach, or if you think of the workspace, right? the workspace has kind of this arc shape to it, uh, this, this ring shape to it. If you're inside, you can't reach it, which kind of is the other condition. And the best thing you can do is you can collapse and try to get in as tightly as you can, which means, in this case, a gamma of zero. Does that make sense? So this is kind of the singularity that is the out of reach singularity. Right? If you get something that's way out there, all you do is you stretch your arm out or you fold your arm in. So do you guys buy? that that is a singularity. And it's a particular type of singularity where you can kind of, it's, I don't know, out of reach. Right? And so you can still get to the closest possible if you want. But anytime you get an equation with a cosine or a sine for that matter, and you do an inverse on it, You've got to check whether the argument is greater than or less than minus one, greater than one or less than minus one, if it's a valid argument, right? So it's the same kind of problem as with the A tangent, in that you've got to make sure that that function actually exists and works. And the A tangent is a lot easier to deal with, but um, the sines and cosines you got to deal with. So does it make sense how the math works out and the math shows you that that singularity is there? So. Assuming I've solved this triangle, do you guys buy that I can then also calculate my alpha? Okay, I'm going to go over here just because it's all next to each other. Do you guys remember sine alpha over A is sine gamma over C? And I guess A I should define sine alpha over this length, which is L2 sine gamma over its opposing length, which I guess is d, which is square root of r squared plus h squared if you want. Or 
I can flip it around and basically use this equation and say it is d squared. Um, so I could also say this is d. Sorry, then I can use it for that equation. Do you agree that then alpha is just going to be a sine of L2 over d times sine? If gamma exists, is there any way that that equation won't work? Uh, short answer is no. Right? So what I can do is, when I fold up, I probably would set alpha to zero. If I said that, I would probably set alpha to zero. And here, I would set alpha equals um, a sine of L2 comma D times sine gamma. I would put that in this condition, right? Because when those two are happening, you're folding and unfolding, alpha is just going to be zero. Might as well put it in there. And in all normal circumstances, that would be well defined because you already checked that the triangle is valid. Is that making sense? Um, this is in some ways good old geometry, but it's you got to be a little bit picky about whether conditions are okay or not. Everyone okay with how to get the gamma and alpha? Yes? So if I'm understanding this right, this definition of alpha is explicitly saying that it's elbow up? Uh, no. Your very good comment, because that's exactly where we're going. Assuming you're given this triangle, you're absolutely right in that the next thing that happens is this elbow up and elbow down question. So I have solved this funny little triangle. Uh, yeah, I do need to come back to this, but we'll rewrite what we need. So I have solved an R and an H and said this is my target point and I've solved a triangle that is gamma and alpha. My argument being, let me actually draw it out, alpha, gamma. My argument being that triangle works equally well. Right? Do you agree that that is just a pure symmetry? So now the question is, you're right, which one of those two do you pick? So there is an elbow up, in which case, do you agree that Q1 is a tangent 2 of h comma r plus alpha, and Q2 is, let me make sure I do this right, uh, where are we, hey, with, where am I, there I am, is uh, minus 180 degrees plus gamma, elbow down, right, is Q1 is equal to a tangent to h comma r minus alpha, and Q2 is gamma plus, uh, what am I doing here? Uh, yeah, 180 degrees minus gamma. So when I go through this process, basically I draw the triangle. I look at my knowing sine and cosine rules, which I have to admit I can't remember either. I look it up. I just looked it obviously up over the weekend, so I know what it is at the moment. Um, and then you get an inverse of those cosine functions. Every time you get that, you've got to think about is that valid or not. That tells you that there's a singularity, right? which means there are conditions, in this case, where you can't reach it. Every time you find a singularity, guess what you're going to find? You're going to find branches on either side of the singularity. Right? And so that should happen every time you find it. And so the question, I actually did put in the homework. I meant to put in the homework. 
is basically how many singularities are in your system. There won't be one singularity, there will be multiple versions, multiple ways that you can be singular. If I look at this planar arrangement of R and H, do you guys, everyone happy with getting the angles, converting those angles into the two branches of the two solutions? So if I write an IK function, I have to basically choose which one I'm going to do. I can return two possible solutions if you want, or you just tell it which branch it's supposed to be on and it returns the appropriate solution. But there are two ways to solve it. Everyone okay with that? And I want to be sure because basically I'm going to ask you to implement this. Um, so I want to make sure that makes sense. So, yes? Uh, what is A1, this context? Uh, A1? Or is that Q1? Oh, sorry, this is supposed to be Q1. Join angles. So, in this case, I paid careful attention. I found the singularity, which I think everyone remembers, right, that there's a singularity when you stretch your arm all the way out. And that means there's a mirror when you stretch your arm all the way in. I think of it as the same singularity, it's just one is out and one's in. Um, and that basically tells me what is happening with this triangle. If you go back to First part, how many singularities are in this thing? Can someone spot the other singularity? I shouldn't have done this, probably. I should have. Don't erase the other part yet. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll put that up there. So we had said, let me put it over here. I should have done this in the first place and saved it. We had said Q0 was a tangent two of y comma x, right? Because x was equal to r times cosine q zero, y was r times sine q zero, and z was equal to h. That was our given, and so this is how we pick q two, right? And then we said from there, r was square root of x squared plus y squared, and h was equal to z. And I probably shouldn't have done it, but I've decided to, and I don't know why. Um, can anyone spot the omission there? So we already solved the y over x problem. That is just a mathematical weirdness that we solved with the a tangent too. There's still a slight problem there. Sorry, you were about to raise your hand. Uh, I, was just gonna, I was just gonna say when z is like too high, because it's an infinite distance away, then you can never find. Uh, if z is way, way, way above the robot, then r becomes really, really, really large. When r becomes really, really large, this becomes really, really negative, which means you're stretching out your arm as high as you can go. And I don't know if you're demonstrating, you're asking a question. John's going to make the next sketch. Yes. Has r is zero? Yes. So we've talked about different times. There's this singularity where I can't reach. And that means. When I'm in that singularity, right, I lose the ability to move farther out. And I actually move, lose the ability to move in. And I've got to decide, am I going to go elbow up, or am I going to go elbow, sorry, elbow down, or elbow up? The other singularity is when I'm right here. Because I can't move out of the plane. I can move in the plane just fine. I can rotate the plane, right? But I can't move out of the plane. And so if I have a scenario, here I'm trying, sorry my core technique is totally falling apart on me here. If I have a scenario where I take this arm and I put it right here with the joints being in the plane, do you guys agree that I can rotate around but I can't move out of the plane anymore? That singularity shows up when r is equal to zero. Which is really when x is equal to y is equal to r is equal to zero. Well, I should write it as x equals zero and y equals zero. Right? How in this math does it show up? Where in the math does it blow up numerically? Why is this a singularity? Where do I see the singularity being singular? I mean, r is well defined. Square root of zero is zero, right? There's no problem there. I'm being particular. Well, any value of Q0, you can always say that Q0 is 
Yes. This, instead of being a function that has a unique argument, eh, sorry, a unique value, right, becomes ill-determined. The code, I believe, returns zero at that point. But do you agree that q0, that an a tangent two of zero comma zero is not well-defined? Um, right, that there's multiple solutions that you can do anything here. So a cosine and a sine are fairly straightforward to spot because the arguments just become bigger than one and it's just nonsense. A tangent two is better than a tangent, but a tangent two still has this problem. And the thing is the code never complains. The code run happ runs happily. It just picks q0 being zero. But this is a singularity and it is one with kind of multiple solutions, right? So it's slightly different than the other one. It is one where you can pick any Q2, and so you may not even notice that you have that singularity there. But I'm gonna ask one follow-on question, which is every singularity comes with a pair of branches that you get to pick. Can someone point to me where the branches are here? What are the two options that I'm ignoring? Elbow up and elbow down. So I'm at this point here. So I could be on either side of it. How is that two different branches? The question is slightly ill-posed, I agree. I have made a statement, which is whenever there's a singularity, there are two sides of a singularity. And basically, the two sides become two branches of your solutions. They become equally valid solutions. And you gotta pick which one. An elbow down and elbow up is a fairly easy to spot. People see it, and yes. My statement then goes, I found another singularity, which is when z is perfectly equal to zero. And the code will still return a q0, zero, zero, but do you agree that there's actually many, many possible solutions here? So this is a singularity. The singularity brings with it that it is a branch point. If I am to the left of the singularity versus to the right of the singularity, there will be two possible solutions that I can choose from. And I haven't spotted them yet. And the solutions are basically right there. If I take the square root, there are a positive and a negative value that you can use. If I draw my system, sorry, I don't want to erase everything yet, but at the same time my board is terrible. If I find this solution, how about I take the arm, I rotate it 180 degrees, and then swing right over the top. Do you buy that that is another way to get to this point? Or said another way, if I am straight up, I can either bend down forward, or I can bend down backwards and rotate around. And that both gets me to that point. Now, usually people don't think of it because you don't want to bend your roller backwards and go over or not. It's kind of silly. But I mean, if you're a straight vertical, right, you can, and I ask you to go over, let's say my arm is like, like this, and I ask you to reach over there, I can go down and reach it there, or I can go down and reach it there, right? And that will turn my base this way, or it'll turn my base that way. So there are actually two different ways I can find this point. And what that means is, effectively, I have a negative r, and guess what? You look at those equations, they're perfectly well defined for a negative r. There is nothing in here that ever said r had to be positive. It's just our human intuition that likes r to be a positive number because we think of it as a positive number. Does that make sense? Yeah, I thought we were looking at what r is zero. What do you mean by negative? So r equals zero is the singularity. Mm -hmm. Now there are two sides of the singularity that you can be on. You can either be in a positive r in which case your arm is in front of your base. Meaning when you're approaching singularity, right? We're talking about like coming at the singularity from both sides, which is different branches. 
there are, yes, so what, I'm, what I mean by this is if I give you a non-singular XYZ, there are multiple ways you can reach it. For example, you can go elbow up or elbow down. Duh. The point where elbow up and elbow down meet is when I'm all the way stretched out because it, what is it? Elbow up or elbow down? It's the same, right? It's the same thing. So I'm saying the other situation that happens for this mechanism is the similarity of r equals zero. So if I command a point that is in front of me, I can either make that a positive r and be in front, or I can turn around and make it a negative r. So there are two ways I can set up my mechanism, this way or that way, right, that get me to that point. So there are two solutions to the inverse kinematics of reaching that point. R positive or R negative? And they meet at R equals zero. At R equals zero, you can't say I'm on the front or the back because you're right over. Right? So every singularity has two sides to it. And we implicitly picked one. We picked an R positive. So we implicitly picked one of the two branches without ever noticing. And that's actually why eight square root functions, because there are actually two possible answers to it, right? There's always the positive and negative, except you kind of ignore the negative because for convenience we don't like it and like it just drops away. Yes? Uh, is this from the perspective of coming, you, your start, start state is in the singularity and you're coming out? Or is this from the perspective of you can be in any state and you you'd still have two choices to go to like this new state? Um, so this is not meant to be a movement. So this is meant to be a, I ask you to reach a point in front of you. How can you, what uh, joint values can you give me that will reach that point? Okay, By reach, yeah, I don't mean move towards, I mean solutions. Gotcha. So I don't have to go through the singularity, right? And so I am, so I'm, it's easier to think about in the elbow case. If I'm here and I'm here and I'm here, my elbow is always up and it's fine. But I could do all of that with elbow down. Once I'm in that branch, I tend to stay within the branch. Once I'm in this branch, I tend to stay within this branch. Okay. I can do it this way, or I can do it this way. Well, I can move. <laughs> My tendency is to stay in that branch, or I can stay within the branch. Right. If you're writing a general solver that says, here's my XYZ, give me my cues, well, you've got to pick which branch it's going to be. And you will probably pick the same branch all the time, because you won't want to jump branches. So it is very likely that you will pick the R greater than zero branch all the time. But the point is, is, that was a choice being made. If you want to switch branches, you have to go through the singularity to get to the other side. Does that answer the question, kind of? Yeah. So my comment is that when I spot an A tangent of 2, I see that there's a singularity there at R equals 0. So actually, what I don't like is I don't like the square root. What I would write is r equals cosine q0 times x plus sine q0 times y. Do you buy that equation? Right. If I give you x and I give you y and I ask you what is r, do you buy that that gives me r? Once I've picked a q0, this becomes and tells me what my r is. And so the branches, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to write it up here so it's clear. So the branches are basically either q0 is going to be the a tangent to, sorry, of y comma x, or if a2 is going to be the a tangent to of y comma x plus 180 degrees. Right? And then r is going to be cosine q0 x plus sine q0 times y. Which effectively means in one case it's r is positive, in one case it's negative. Do you guys buy that? So it's subtle, and usually when you write it, you just kind of implicitly pick the case. I just want to be kind of a little bit pedantic 
when you go through the analytic inverses, you find the inverse of these tangent, uh, tangent sine and cosine functions, right? And every time you spot that, that is probably going to be a singularity. And every time you have a singularity, you have a branch. So how many singularities are in the system? There's two different singularities, <coughs> which also means you have two to the two possible branches. So there are four branches here in total, right? There's elbow up in front. There's elbow up in back. There's elbow down in front. Oh, I can't do it. You know what I mean. There's elbow down in the back. So two singularities, two choices, two to the n, four possible solutions that you have for this. Yeah? Well, that common style. So nothing mathematically really nasty other than it is one of those exercises of thinking about it. And so one thing that I should have put in the homework, um, but I mean, I will probably ask people on the fly is like, where are your singularities? How many do you have? Where are they? And for this mechanism, there's two, right? And those are the choices. And you think about it, right? You can take your arm and you can rotate it and it'll look different. It'll be flipped upside down, but it'll get to the same point. So we've solved a given the wrist point, well, given the tip plus orientation, right? You can decide where the wrist is, um, x, y, and z. And for that, we've now solved j, 0, 1, and 2. So the other part is orientation. Orientation is a tiny little bit funkier. Um, in that I want to talk about two minutes worth, three minutes worth, um, about how do you define orientation. So if you have a six DOF robot, right, that means there's three DOF orientation, right, and then yes, use a rotation matrix. Most of us don't have that. So if I have a four DOF system, Agree that there's only one DOF left for orientation. So how do I define my orientation? I need one angle. What's the most likely angle that you're going to pick? Well, it depends a little bit on your project. But if you think about most projects, they tend to have, I erased all the drawings, right? They tend to have a robot and then they have a little bit of a wrist joint on the end. And so a possible angle is just the angle with respect to horizontal. Am I pointing down? Am I not pointing down? Right? So that means you might do one angle. For example, pointing up down. I.e., with respect, that is the orientation with respect to horizontal. So if, if you have your typical mechanism, do you agree that this is the wrist point, right, and this is the tip point? Do you agree that basically this angle Do you agree that that angle might be, let's say, theta? Might be the angle from the horizontal that I want my tip to be. And you probably want it to be vertical when you're grabbing stuff, and you maybe want it horizontal when you're inserting and stuff, or who knows. Would you agree that in this case, for example, for this robot, it is just the sum of these three angles? Which means that is the Fkin. Right? The ikin just says, well, Q3 is therefore going to be the, right? Ford off, very straightforward because there's only one angle. How about five off? If I have a five off mechanism, do you buy that I need two angles? So, for example, 
of folks have a mechanism that does this, and then there is an output roll that can rotate the gripper and spin it. Well, what might you pick as the two angles? The angle with respect to the horizontal and then the, or the angle of orientation of the gripper. So you could put a um, kind of horizontal angle, horizontal angle, I still like that. And then, yes, is there an, I don't know, B kind of is the output roll angle. You guys agree that that might be two angles that you pick? Okay, I have a question for you. If I'm pointing straight down, what makes my angle zero? Does it mean it's lined up perfectly with this plane? So if I move around, am I moving like this? Or is my angle like this? Do you know what I mean? Is if I take my gripper, and I'm assuming that my two fingers are kind of my gripper, do I want a, an output roll angle of zero? What if I'm over here? Do I want it to be relative to the base, or do I want it to be relative to, fixed to the warp? I assume you want to go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, assume you do the, the same coordinate transform that you did for each of the like, motors, you would be calculating an angle relative to the base, but you might find it more useful to find one relative to the table. For like picking up objects. So if an object is sitting in the world, it's got a certain rotation. So that you probably want to define that angle as an absolute angle. So if I pick, if I am pointing down, right, do you agree that I might pick my output angle to be Q Z Q4 minus Q0? Right? So that as I rotate my base, I turn the output roll, and that way I am perfectly lined all the time. Right? So that would be with respect to kind of the world. I can define that. I can just say that's my definition of my output angle. I have a question. If I define that output angle, what if I am pointing horizontally? If I go up. Now, as I rotate, Q4 doesn't move. Q0 does. Uh, do I want it to be rolling? I assume you want the angle to be the angle with respect to horizontal. So you might actually prefer to have it be just Q4 with respect to kind of the horizontal. So it gets a little funky. Orientations always get a little bit funky. So three ways you can solve it. And I'm not, I have my preferences and they'll probably show, but in the end, I guess I'll let you choose what you want. Option one define my output roll V to be Q4. Just call it Q4. That's the definition of my output roll. The problem is that it keeps rotating with you when you're pointing straight down. So is that useful? It makes things kind of awkward, right? But you can just define it if you want. Option two, define multiple cases. Which means if I do an ikin of x comma y comma z, and say theta is 90 degrees, i.e. down, right? Then I take my phi and I say phi is really q4 minus q0, which means that I'm going to solve q4 equals phi plus q0. Or I can do a case if I call ikin with x comma y comma z and do theta equals 0, which means it's horizontal, comma phi. I might assume that phi now means that's just q4. In which case, I solve Q4 equals 5. But then I have to be careful, else error. right? Because I haven't defined anything in between. So I don't can't solve anything in between. Does that make sense? So I could program my inverse kinematics to have two options. I could say, give me a straight down thing where my output role is fixed relative to world. In which case, that will be my answer. 
Or I can say, give me something horizontal, in which case, that would be my answer. But it means your ICANN can't take an angle other than 0 or 90, because I don't know what to do between them. Right? So option three is you try to combine them, and you create this really muddled thing. Which is I define phi equals q4 plus sine of theta times q0. And I call that my output rule. Because guess what? If I ask for it to be straight down, it'll naturally be relative to work. If I ask for something horizontal, it'll naturally be relative to horizontal. And if I ask for something in between, it'll be in between. So now you have a continuous solution, right, where your icon of x comma y comma z comma theta comma phi gives me q0 out to q4, and you can figure out what that is. So, eh, it's kind of definition of what you choose. Really what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an icon function where you can specify what you want and you get the angles that you need, right? And so probably you only care about those two cases, right? So either one of these will get you what you want. Does that make sense? In the last 30 seconds, sorry, the piece that we didn't talk about is usually you think of grip. And the question is, do you include grip in all of this? And I'll tell you what, now we're already late. Let's do it on, on Wednesday. Um, so when I think of ICANN, I a lot of times actually do an ICANN of x, y, z, theta, phi, comma, grip. And you can define grip, for example, to be 0 to 1 if it's open to closed, or something like that. Which sometimes is convenient, sometimes it's pointless. We'll talk briefly. And then let's do the numeric solution, which I don't think we're really going to need, but I want to go through the algorithm um, on Wednesday. But does it kind of make sense where I can now give you an xyz coordinate, and you can figure out what the joint values are if you go through this slightly annoying math? And that means we can move to those coordinates. Please. Uh, how would we move to those coordinates? Just basically have ah, yes. the interpolation of those XYZs? These are the solution of what it will be. Yeah. Basically, I would ask, go back to homework two, where we had move two trajectories, right? And you had a, you had a two DOF, and you moved the two DOF. Well, move a five DOF. Basically, do the same kind of splines across those five joints. But we will talk about it on Wednesday as well. OK. And I think that's what the homework is specifying between the joint control